event and other things are free. So thanks again. Um, and thanks for coming. This is a new venue, um, but it's the same idea we've had for several years now. We want to take the most interesting and important people in media and tech and see what happens when we mash them together. Um, big transition year, a lot of M&A happening, a lot of M&A not happening. That's adjusted our schedule a bit. We lost one speaker because his company was uh, sold. Uh, he doesn't have a job. There's another speaker who was going to come, but his company has not acquired the other company yet, so he can't make it. Uh, Maggie Haberman has the flu. No, no trends there, so she can't make it for that reason. Uh, we brought in Jonah Preddy from BuzzFeed, which is not a replacement, but he's pretty good. Um, the next two people are, have been here from the get-go ever since we talked about this event. Uh, one of them I work with. That's Kara Swisher. She's the co-founder of Recode. Uh, and the other is Lydia Polgreen. She is the, what is her title? She's the editor-in-chief of HuffPost. Let's bring them both out. your hand there and look at a picture. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. You too. Thank you. Uh, Lydia. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. It's great to be here. I mean, look, I know that uh, last year you had Hillary Clinton. Hard to top that, um, but I'm, you know, I, luckily I was available. Kofevi? Kofevi. Yeah. You got anyway, it. so let's get started. You've had, this, you've had this job for a year and change? That is correct, a little over a year, um, and it's been kind of a wild year. I it, was thinking you shouldn't take it. I was thinking it was a terrible idea for you to go run a content company owned by the phone company. Now it looks not so bad. Well, I think that any content company um, has to be thinking about the fact that all content consumption is converging onto mobile devices. And so it turns out that in 2018, um, probably the best owner you could have is the phone company. So um, I'm feeling really good about this convergence and in this particular moment where HuffPost is sitting. But let's be clear, you, you can make content that will go on any phone. You don't need to be owned by the phone company for that to work. That's true, but if you're owned by the phone company and you have powerful relationships with equipment manufacturers, if you have uh, great technology teams that are building uh, dedicated experiences for the phone, I think it gives you an enormous leg up. So explain that, Leva, because I, I was part of you going. I mean, we talked about it quite a bit. <laughs> Lydia and I know each other really well. Um, it's a little like lesbian Ford, mafia. Yeah, a little lesbian mafia. Yeah. Um, it's called the Militia Etheridge. Uh, <laughs> Come to my window. Uh, so, but we talked about it a lot. And there mm -hmm. was, you know, you came from the New York Times, yep. which was, you know, an old newspaper, kind of a, a traditional newspaper. And also company. now a very successful digital media company. Absolutely, yeah. apparently. Um, and you... Uh, Manifestly. They absolutely are. They're doing yeah. great. Um, but you were on your way up the masthead in sort of a traditional, and you'd been there since you were 12 or something yeah, like that. Yeah, something like that. Um, I, I, I'm not sure whether to say I'm sorry to encourage you to have done that or not some days. I, you know what I mean when I think about all the changes that are happening there. But talk about what the problems of being part of a bigger company is. Now, we're owned by Comcast, I mean, not, uh, investment by Comcast. So, uh, you we've know. We've got to re rewalk. We're not owned by Comcast. We're not owned by Comcast. No. no. Minority investor in Vox Media. I'm yes. sorry, that, that was next week. Anyway. Um, <laughs> so, um, they always try to make news at these conferences. Yeah, but but when, you're, when you have that ownership, what are the, what do you worry about at, in that? In, you have Comcast owning NBC. You've got AT&T allegedly buying some companies at some point. Mm -hmm. You have yours. Talk about the problems you foresee as a content maker, because you are a content maker at your core. Absolutely, content maker at the core. I think um, the, the, the biggest issue that any journalist would work, worry about is interference and independence. Um, and that has just not been an issue at all. Uh, we've taken very strong stands at HuffPost on questions of net neutrality, written very critically about monopoly power and things like that. So our journalistic independence uh, uh, has been sacrosanct, and um, you know, I honestly didn't really have any concerns about that going in. Um, I do think that looking ahead at a world in which the device on which we're getting our content um, also is owned by people who are making content, I think that there are real questions of free, free speech and um, accessibility, particularly in a world without net neutrality. And those are things that we're going to have to conf confront and cover. Um, you want to be part of a vibrant ecosystem of information. That's what's good for democracy. Um, I would not, I, I would love for HuffPost as a business to have uh, some kind of privileged access to 
to pipelines that are built by Verizon, but I certainly wouldn't want that to be the case at the exclusion of other voices. What do you, what do you think Verizon wants from you? Like, if you look at where they've been spending money on their content stuff, it's all video, video, video. Mm -hmm. it's go 90, it's yep. NFL highlights deals, it's an NBA deal. Um, you guys do some video, but it's not your thing. Mm -hmm. you, know, you haven't leaned hard into video. You have a lot of words. We, we have a lot of words, but you know, it turns out that words are actually a really convenient way to consume information, um, you know, particularly news. And news is the, um, uh, my, one of my bosses, Simon Kalaf, likes to say that news is the dial tone um, of, um, of media. And I Does always he say to say him, that to you? he does. And I always say to him, you know, dial tone, you might want to think about a slightly more modern reference. But I think it's true. It's the thing that, it's the thing that, that gets people coming back every day again and again and again. And we do a lot of video. The, the reality is we've seen a 300% growth since we brought on Shelly Venus as our head of video from Mike. Uh, we've seen 300% growth in our, uh, um, in our distributed video, 90% uh, growth year over year on, on YouTube, for example. Uh, the level of engagement, I mean, our, our completion rate on our Apple News video, most people on Apple News have very low completion rates. Ours is up, I think, above 40%. So, uh, so we're actually doing a ton of video, and I see HuffPost as being a really important laboratory for new ideas about how to create and... and so when you uh, talk about that video, content. what video works? Because, you know, a lot of the video is just... There, you know, some of them are great. There, there's yep. a lot of interesting video, but it's not the traditional news video, and it's not some yep. of it's you know more explainers or funny or different things. Like, what works for you guys? Well, we find we we've, we've been experimenting a lot with different formats. Um, you know, we have a a great new product that we created called the Post Show that is two people talking about the Oscars, two people talking about the Grammys. Um, huge engagement. A lot of people want to watch. A lot of people want to engage with it and send in questions and things like that. Um, you know. We've done a lot of the same sorts of short video, um, you know, video with text on the screen. That does great on social. I think no one monetizes that stuff. It's great for getting your brand out there, but ultimately it's not really what you're about. Uh, we're making some long-term bets on um, documentary style video, um, things that are, um, you know, 30, 60, 90 minute length. Um, we're not ready to talk about the subject matter yet, but um, keep an eye out for that. So we're, we're, we're trying a lot of different things and playing in a lot of different spaces, and we'll see which one of them um, turns out to be most exciting for us. You mentioned social. We're going to have the folks from Facebook on directly after this. Um, everyone's aware there's a lot going on at Facebook. Um, how are the, the shifts that they've made and the shifts that they've announced affecting your business? I think that the um, I think that there's likely going to be some period of uncertainty. I mean. As of right now, it's essentially had no effect. Um, but I think what we're what what we've been told to expect is lots of turbulence, lots of changes, lots of tweaks that may have big effects, small effects. But like most publishers who are producing original content, that's you know deep original journalism, um, we've actually seen a significant. Um, um, decline in how much of our traffic is coming from Facebook, and it's been made up by the resurgence of, of Google. And that was a, prior to oh, the announcement. Oh, long before, yeah. yeah. And for us, I would say Apple News is actually, in some ways, a more important platform. Um, and Apple News is a place where people actually intentionally go to to uh, consume news. So um, so we've actually had tremendous success there. And the, and the story of HuffPost has really been one of surfing the waves of content disruption, right? I mean, it was first it was Google, and they surfed, that, they surfed the hell out of that SEO wave and became the number one um, SEO publisher. Uh, what time is the Super Bowl, everyone? Um, most famous headline of HuffPost history. Um, and, and then social comes along. We become the number one publisher on Facebook. Um, now, Apple won't say this, but I think we're pretty close to being the number one publisher on Apple News. And, um, you know, that's the superpower of HuffPost is the ability to make really great content that resonates with, with our audience wherever they go. And so we feel really well, good about was, our ability. Why did that fall off on Facebook? I'm sorry? Your, how, did, how come it fell? Did you pull back your efforts or did you? I think it's a mix of factors. I think it's partly that it wasn't necessarily the place where we, where we felt we were going to find the audience that was most interested in what we were doing. I mean, we follow, like all modern digital media companies, we follow where the audience is going. And um, as, as Facebook became less and less a place where people were going for news, we started to put our efforts elsewhere and we really invested in Apple News. And we really doubled down on SEO because it turns out that SEO is really important. Um, so for example, uh, entertainment is a really big part of what we do, uh, lifestyle, uh, cultural reporting. So we've, we've made some long-term investments in um, our coverage of, of 
streaming shows. And it's really service-oriented journalism for people who are like, what should I watch? Um, like and, what's on Netflix this month? That's yeah, stuff? Yeah. yeah, that kind of stuff. And um, so laying that groundwork and having a smart strategy about how you're going to really be there and serve your audience with the information that they need when they need it and when they're looking for it, I think that's much more reliable than um, sort of surfing the uncertain, uh, a lot of surfing talk, I think yeah. it must be the location. But when you're saying the uncertain, what, was, was the fake news stuff and other criticisms of Facebook also impacting it? How do you look at that? I mean, well, you covered it. As yeah, a no, I mean, it's a huge story for us. But, um, you know, I think, I think that for us, Facebook, both from a monetization perspective and also as a place for us to connect with our audience, um, it's just not necessarily been a particularly reliable partner. Um, and I think that that's, I don't know that that's necessarily Facebook's conscious doing, but it's just the reality of how their business works. So we've sought out other ways where we can connect with our audience in meaningful ways. Now, I will, I will say, however, that we have invested significantly in community pages that are in many cases, not even branded HuffPost. So, for example, we have a um, we have a page for millennial introverts called Cancelled Plans, and we feed a lot of HuffPost um, content into it. But yeah. we also take a lot of stuff from other places. But it's basically for us a petri dish in which we can understand: is this an area where we really want to invest in doing more journalism? Um, you know, we have one for millennial Muslims called uh, Tomorrow Inshallah. Um, we have a, a closed Facebook group called So You Want to Raise a Feminist that sprung up out of our parenting coverage uh, post 2016 election. And those are really important places for us to understand our audience and to develop content strategies around subjects that we, we think we want to invest in. You're the, you're the, I botched your title at the beginning. You're editor in chief. That is correct. You're the second editor in chief at HuffPost. I am. First one is named Ariana Huffington. Her name is on the map. Her, her name is, her name is, is, is in, in our name. So, yeah. how do you, when you take over something like that that is literally identified with one person, how do you go about over a year saying, we want to do something new, we want to keep some of our old audience, we want to do new things? How do you think that through? And, and let me add, you've gotten rid of much of the old management, correct? Well, there's definitely been some, some turnover. I mean, there are people who... who you turned them over. You turned them over, yeah. Well, there's <laughs> there have been some departures. Mistakes were made. Yeah. <laughs> there have been some, there's been some departures. I mean, look, Ariana created an extraordinary <laughs> brand. You know, um, when I worked for the New York Times, I used to go all around the world, talk to people about media brands, and the fact that HuffPost was as ubiquitous as the New York Times, which has been around since 1860 something, is a testament to the power of the thing that Ariana built. Um, and all companies uh, that are founder run, I think try to figure out how do we save and keep what is most important about the DNA of this thing in order to give it life after the founder leaves. And I think it was a really, it was really an open question, what does a post Ariana uh, Huffington Post look like? Um, and you know, I knew coming in that, I, that there were certain things about HuffPost that we really wanted to preserve. And you know, keeping, is... keeping audience at the center of it, um, elevating voices that, are, that don't usually get a platform, um, trying, really thinking about the wholeness of the person, uh, that dedication to helping people live really fulfilling, healthy lives. Um, those kinds of things, I think, are really essential to our identity. And so th those have remained. But there are other things that have, have really changed, and probably the most dramatic change since Ariana's departure um, is that we shut down the contributor network, which was really a founding um, Spell feature. Spell what a contributor network is. So the contributor network was essentially a, a blog where people could upload their own content to um, to, the, to HuffPost, and it would be featured on, on the HuffPost homepage. For free. For, for free, yeah. And, and you know, people would get invited, and then at a certain point it became almost a, you know, anybody who applies can, can, can blog here. And circa 2005, that was a revolutionary concept, um, the idea that, a, a, that there would be a platform of that kind. Um, and people often forget just how influential it was. I didn't realize this until I went back and revisited a the lot Ari of the history. Thing around the Ari Emanuel thing. Uh, but but when, Barack, when candidate Barack Obama wanted to respond to uh, the the allegations about his former pastor, Reverend Wright, he chose to blog on, on HuffPost, um, then the Huffington Post. And so it was, a, it was a thing that had an enormous amount of cultural currency and weight at the time. And, but now, fast forward to 2018, we, we actually have an, a surfeit of um, platforms in which people can express themselves, and we have the opposite problem of just complete cacophony. There's so much information out there. And we, as a, as a, as a newsroom, 
found that there was tremendous confusion about what is contributor content, what is actual journalism that's been created by the HuffPost newsroom. And so at this point in our history, it seemed to make sense, particularly in the environment of fake news and all kinds of um, all kinds of nastiness that's going on in our business and the payments issue. and well well and that and, and for me that that was also a critical one is that if we wanted to increase the um, if we wanted to increase the quality of work that we were getting from our contributors we would need to commission pieces rather than just say if you want to write write and I, it's my personal belief that if you commission someone to do something you, you have to pay them for it i mean i'm it, all for getting paid for work and i think mm -hmm. that's a good idea and i think content is a good thing to pay for um but you know the other reason that that, that people like the idea of contributor networks Forbes.com still has them, and I think Tron was going to have one, I assume, is that they do generate a lot of content that you could put ads against. Did you, when you told the folks at Verizon, we're going to cut off this content making factory that we have, did they push so, back? So, little couple of numbers for you. Um, the Piece, the, the pieces that we've done on the two sections that we created that are these paid and commission sections, one's called Opinion, which is a kind of traditional op-ed page, and the other is called Personal, which is really, for, really about first-person storytelling and, and what we're calling person-first storytelling, as told to, things like that. We're on track to exceed the um, number of, uh, total number of page views by um, as much as 25% in our first month uh, from what we got from the, uh, the contributor network. And you're talking about a tiny, tiny fraction. I mean, there were thousands of pieces that would come over the transom into the contributor network every month, and you know we're doing maybe 100 um, altogether, and we're getting the we're getting 25% more traffic from doing that 100 pieces. So, so you get um, better content. We get, we get better eyeballs. content that gets more eyeballs. Now, the average piece is getting over 50 times uh, the uh, number of page views than a contributor piece we used to, the average contributor piece used to get. So. To me, it just, I don't understand how anybody thinks that you're going to get scale out of publishing stuff that doesn't necessarily Meet. find an audience. Right. You know? that's, that's Facebook, right? It's full of free content, right? It's full Popular of free content, but it's users. free content that's, that's connected to people that you know, so it's free content that presumably will be relevant to you. Um, I mean, look. The, the idea of taking a bunch of content and throwing it up on the internet and, and, and charging for advertising alongside it is a, a very like 2007, 2008 business model. Um, there, there is essentially no business in that kind of scale without real definition, a real, a real sense of who your audience is, a deep relationship with that audience, and something that you can sell. Um, it's, it's just not, you know, I mean, we're part of Oath, right? And Oath has Yahoo.com, they have AOL.com. We touch over a billion consumers every month. So I don't think they're looking at, to us and saying, give us more page views. We got tons of page views. They're, it's a different kind of value that you're seeking when you're creating you, content. You mentioned Yahoo. Mm -hmm. You do not have purview over Yahoo News. Why is that? What and what's happening there? I'm sorry. You don't have purview over Yahoo News. Well, right? so I'm part of the news group um, that right. is run by uh, Jared Groost, who's the CEO, mm -hmm. and so we work collaboratively with Yahoo News, which right. is um, you know a small news team that was part of the legacy Yahoo um, mm -hmm. platform, and uh, and they're there. We but we all report up into the same board. But why don't? Why isn't it just one? Is that going to happen? Is that something? You know, I, I think that's a that's a question that 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 people are thinking about is how do we rationalize the resources that we have? Um, you know, you've got HuffPost, you've got Yahoo News, you've got Yahoo Entertainment, you've got HuffPost Entertainment, you've got Yahoo Finance. There's a lot of different brands. And look, you know, we're just a little more than six months into this. So I think that there are some, there are some um, questions that I think are going to get ironed out eventually. What but, would you um, like? Well, you know, I think that, I think that in any content business, um, you want to try and focus your efforts and remove overlap as much as possible. So I think if you're going to have different brands within a company, they need to be really clearly identified and articulated. And I mean, one of the things that I really admire about Vox is that it's very clear what what is Eater's purview? What you know, even you know, you could say Recode and, and The Verge have some overlap, but they really don't. They they do very different things. And so I think that. Um, you know, the, the broader strategy has to be one towards thinking in a very clear way and a very defined way about what lane you're in and, and how, how those so different brands work together. When you're thinking together. of Yahoo News, for mm -hmm. example, which was a groundbreaking, another groundbreaking thing that was first, uh, I think most people I, I just laughed because we got another Yahoo question. In it. Oh, good. Okay, good. Yeah. But I'm just wondering, because should it go away? 
just the way the contributor network did? Um, or do you see well, it? Well, no. I mean, I think, I think right. you know, there, the, Yahoo News is basically two different things, right? Um, Yahoo is a uh, remains. I know people don't. People think, oh, who has it? Lots of people go to Yahoo every yeah. single day. They have it as their as their homepage. Um, people, lots of people go to AOL.com. A lot of people go to AOL.com yeah. as well. Um, and so th uh, it's a mix of there's a there's a small team that does original journalism as part of Yahoo News. Yeah. But from a consumer facing perspective, Yahoo News is just your you know you go to Yahoo.com and those are um, those are. It's full of articles that are syndicated from a bunch of different content. Um, you know, even AP, Reuters, um, you know, New York Magazine. You name it; it's all up there. And so, when most people think of Yahoo News, that's what they're thinking of is that um, that platform. But then we also have Newsroom, which is a mobile app that um, that we've been working on and playing around with. That again is 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 filled with content from all these different places and then all the different all, brands all this as stuff well. you make and the folks at Yahoo make as well. It's all free, right? I don't have to pay. Yeah. You're paying for someone to make it. You're letting people read it for free. Yeah, I mean, we monetize through advertising. Every, everyone in digital publishing is thinking about a paywall, mm -hmm. metered paywall, subscriptions, how are we going to do it? That's something you guys want to pursue? You know, I think, um, I think it's, it's an interesting idea. I don't think we're there yet. Um, I really deeply believe in um, having low to no cost to consumer, high quality news available as part of um, a democracy. You know, I think that there's always going to be a part of the population that is never going to lean forward and pay for news. If they do, it's via their cable bundle or in the future possibly via their mobile phone bill. Um, you know, which they're paying for for other reasons, the sports, the entertainment, all those kinds of things, but they'll also flick on CNN when something's happening. Um, so I am very committed to the idea of free to, low, to no cost uh, to consumer news. And uh, given my druthers, I would love for HuffPost to remain as free to no cost to consumers as possible. Um, is there a scenario in which we develop a, a paid product? Sure. You know, is there a scenario in which we develop some sort of a membership strategy? Absolutely. Um, but I think it's a little bit of a ways off. And it's, Are it's, you working on one now or just mulling it? We're just mulling. Mulling? Mulling? Mulling. So we're going to add you to the list of people who want to charge something for something. Maybe. Maybe. I mean, I, you know, one of the reasons that I decided to take this job was um, what I saw is a stratification of society into media haves and have nots. And um, it seems to me that there are a bunch of news organizations that have found, uh, not a bunch, but a handful of news organizations that have found tremendous success in um, in doing great journalism for which they extract money from the best informed people in the world, the people who in many ways need the journalism the least. Um, and I'm really interested in that opposite end of the spectrum. And you know, I think I think the, the folks who, who founded the skim are here and I think they're doing really remarkable work in trying to make news for people who don't necessarily think that they need news. Right. And I think that that's an important thing in a democracy. Getting to that, last year you talked a lot about who you were writing for mm -hmm. and the groups of people that you needed to be writing about, but mm -hmm. actually specifically who you were writing for. Yep. And you said one of the things you wanted to do was reach out to Trump voters, which had not yeah. been something the Huffington Post had done. Well, Ariana had very loudly talked about covering him as entertainment and of course yeah, she's wrong. She she did and I, I I you know I would take a different approach um, personally as a journalist. Um, for me it's less about who you voted for and more about kind of where you stand in the overall political and economic power arrangements. Um, I think that we live in a world in which inequality is deepening and there is a kind of top layer of society that includes pretty much all of us in this room who have kind of detached in an escape pod and are floating away with the American dream. And um, so I really think about that bottom 80% as including a lot of people who voted for Trump, a lot of people who voted for Bernie Sanders, a lot of people who voted for Hillary, but primarily they're people who feel left out of the prevailing political and economic power arrangements. I mean. I got a big tax cut. You probably did too. Um, and I think about the folks who voted for Trump and maybe got a tiny little tax cut, and I want to write stories for them. 
what does that entail then in the past? Because you talked about it, but what did that, what does that become? So one of the big things that we did was this trip across America. Um, we did the Listen to America bus tour. We went to 26 cities. We, we didn't go to the coasts. We were, you know, inland places like Fort Wayne, Indiana, Livingston, Montana, um, and really just listening to people about the issues that were most important in their communities. And we did a tremendous amount of work to try and turn out not just people who would be drawn to a HuffPost event, uh, but people who really wanted to talk about local issues. That involved a lot of outreach through local TV news, which is, turns out is a really important source of information for people in local communities. But we also did a lot of uh, paid Facebook targeting so that we could invite people and reach out to people who didn't necessarily fit into the what you would think of as the HuffPost demographic. So we got a lot of those folks to come to our events, talk to them, um, talk about the issues that are on their minds. And those 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 interviews, and we ended up doing a thousand interviews with, uh, I'm sorry, almost 2,000 interviews with um, people across the country, are really, we're, we're currently in the process of, of analyzing them all now, are really going to inform our, our national reporting strategy. And How do you think that'll change it? I mean, I, and I so imagine that there's a difference between what someone says they want to read and what they actually want to read or what no they question. click on. No right? question. No so question. How are you thinking about how your coverage will change based on this tour? So I think that one thing that's clear is that we need to be focused on 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 issues um, that that really affect people's lives and write about them in, in really kind of relevant ways to, to people's experience. Um, so it's not just about covering Trump and covering the Trump administration. It's not just about who's going to win in 2018 um, and, and those kinds of things, although those, those stories are really important to a significant part of our audience. But, you know, we found that there's tremendous interest, for example, in our coverage of the opioid epidemic, which is like a lot of, a lot of people are covering the opioid epidemic, but we've really taken a kind of service approach to it and writing coverage that's aimed at helping people who are dealing with it and creating communities and newsletters and things like that. So it's less about this is the style of story that we need to do than it is about this is the kind of relationship that we're going to have with our audience and it's fundamentally one of service. Um, and, and that's for me really the, the, the for rather than about question. You know, when a big national news organization goes in and does a story about coal country or does a story about, we just recently did one about air pollution in Orlando, it's really to report back to folks on the Upper West Side or folks in, folks in Pacific Heights about what's going on in that place. Like this there. is what it's like out there. Um, we really strive to be um, writing for the people who are actually experiencing it. Um, so this big global project that we did on, on, on air pollution, we actually, um, again, used some uh, Facebook marketing money to make sure that those stories were being um, read and shared by the communities that are most affected. That said, you've gotten a lot of attention for your Trump administration coverage. Sure, I mean, yeah. I think I think you know the great thing about HuffPost, and this I think was something that didn't that didn't really need changing, is that it has really really strong political coverage, um, and. You know, our team in D.C., uh, you know, they get great scoops. Um, they're really great at defining um, what the most important issues are and saying, don't look over there, look over here. Um, we also have a great team on um, on the Hill that, you know, Matt Fuller has the Freedom Caucus wired. He, you know, we've got a, a, tr a team that does health care like nobody's business. Um, so, you know, I'm incredibly proud of our Washington coverage. And most of what I've done is said, you guys, keep doing what you're doing. You're awesome. So, um, you know, I think, I think that that's, a, that's something that we're getting from our audience is, is, is signals about these are the things we really care about. Strong interest in all of the issues around voting rights and gerrymandering. Strong interest in criminal justice. Strong interest in health care. Um, and so we get those signals and the entire newsroom now is, is really organized around those subjects and going out and chasing them in a really meaningful way. Do you think the media is too much... I found myself for some reason on Fox News last night um, on I watch it all program. the time. But do you, do you think, they, and so, several of the other panels are like, the media is too obsessed with all the ins and outs of the Trump administration. Do you think the media is? Or, it, depends or that on, it's, it depends on how you define the media, right? right. I mean, so I, I look at the New York Times. They have, you know, something like 1,450 journalists. And I think that they, it's absolutely right and correct that they expend considerable time and resources, given the scope of what they cover, to bring us the Maggie Haberman scoops. Um, I'm incredibly grateful that they do that. 
I don't feel like it's our job to compete with that. Um, and I think that when you look at the overall ecosystem, different media organizations have different roles to play. I don't feel like that's our role to play, but I'm grateful that others are but doing it. But do you think the entire media is doing that too much? Because no. I mean, there is a point to be I made. Mean, I, maybe, but, but I, I'm also just, I'm, I, it's, it's not a question that really interests me, I guess, you know, because I just think that, I think that each of us needs to think about our own newsrooms and what we can do to provide something interesting and um, impactful. And I think it's really important that we know what's going on in the White House. And I think that there are a handful of reporters. I mean, you know, Josh Dossie at the um, uh, Washington, now at the Washington Post, just a machine. I love reading those stories, and I think they're really, really interesting, and they're important, and it's important for the historical record. But it's also not the only thing that these news organizations are, are doing. I mean, they're breaking stories left and right. I mean, you look at Politico. I mean, what a, what a year Politico has had. I mean, they, I think they forced out two, maybe three uh, cabinet level. Um, and, and, I, and I think that I, I would, I, I don't think it's my place to say to, uh, to Carrie Budoff Brown, you're putting too many resources into covering the ins and out of the administration, given the scoops that Tim, they're getting. Tim Armstrong's coming on stage tomorrow. If Tim Armstrong gave you a blank check and said, yeah. go do more of whatever you want, what's the next thing you pour a ton of resources into? Um, two things. Uh, one is I'd, we're, we're really excited to expand our, uh, our service journalism because I think that that's actually something that's really important to people and makes people's lives better. And I think of service as not being like what dress to wear, but it's, you know, how do I deal with the fact that I'm part of a generation that is facing a really horrible economic future? How do I make sense of that? Um, so that's one thing. And the other is investigative journalism. I'd love to expand our footprint in investigative journalism. That hasn't traditionally been a huge part of what HuffPost does but I think we could do extraordinary things with it. And, and, and then finally, I think spanning across all those things is, is video. You know, let's create the next version of 48 hours or 60 minutes. Let's, um, you know, let's make documentaries that we distribute on Verizon platforms. So how so. much money do you need? I, you know, I'd, I'd settle for, you know, 50 million. All right, we'll work on it. <laughs> <laughs> Questions from the audience? Questions. There's initial shyness, and then they get up. And if they don't, we'll keep asking Lydia your own questions. All right. Very shy. Um, I'd like to understand, get more into this coverage of how the media is seen. There's mm -hmm. been, well, I want to get into Me Too, too, because you, actually, let me do that first. Me um, Too. Me Too. Um, you guys have done an awful lot, Yasser yeah. and others. How do you look at that story and where it's going? You'd see, you know, there's... Yep blow back and now and then there's yet another story and then there's you know yep. now Oxfam right now and yep. Britain is now blowing yep. up as a big story how do you look where, where that story goes so we've focused on two aspects of it one is um, the enablers um, and media is a big part of that so a lot of the work that that um, that we've been doing um, with um, you know Yashar Ali who works for us um, he's a sort of a super freelancer. Um, who, he works for a few different people, but mostly for HuffPost. Um, he's done a lot of really great work on the media infrastructure that protects a lot of these mm -hmm. abusers. Um, you know, but we also have other reporters who've been working on, you know, Variety, uh, National Enquirer, broke, broken fairly major stories about, about the media, media ecosystem and how it protects people. Um, and then the, on the other end of the spectrum, um, we've been really focused on ordinary working people. So one of our, our labor reporter, Dave Jameson, we still have a labor reporter, um, did a really like gut wrenching story about, um, hotel housekeepers yeah, and, um, and it was one of the most heartbreaking things that I've ever read. And the, the way that it resonated with our audience and people still write to me about it, um, really taking these questions, these kind of structural questions about industries and, um, and writing about them in a holistic way, in a way that's not just about Hollywood stars, but is about ordinary working people is a major focus area for us. So we have a couple of different projects going right now that look at, um, at women in a variety of, of industries, some of them white collar, some of them blue collar. Um, and, um, and that's going to be a major. Do you feel the major. energy around that story, around that narrative, around that theme is dissipating, picking up? Up, staying the same? Um, I definitely don't think it's dissipating. I think that there has been a, uh, there was a backlash and then we've already had a backlash to the backlash. Right. Um, I'm not sure where we are on the Mobius strip right now. Um, but this is going to continue to be a major thing. I, you know, I was at Makers last week and, um, you know, there's just so much conversation about, uh, Makers is a women's conference for those of you who don't know, uh, run by Oath. Um, 
the, the, there's so much energy and conversation and um, and activism that's bubbling up around uh, this issue of of, um, of of gender and really workplace that that I think is not going away anytime yeah. soon. And, um, and extending other places. Ex exactly. Yeah. As Steve Bannon says, women are pissed. Apparently. Yeah. Hey, Rich. You just did actually. Hi, Peter. Hi, Kara. How you doing? So. You know, I Googled while you were talking Huffington Good. Post just to see what would pop up first. And of course, near and dear to Peter's heart and my heart uh, is a story from today, two hours ago, on cord cutting. Uh, on? Cord cutting. Oh, yes. Myths or problems with cord cutting that you didn't know about. Yes. Uh, so I clicked on the story yeah. to read on my phone. And in order to read the whole story, I actually have to pass through 14 ads yeah. for Literally, TurboTax, LendingTree, Allstate, LendingTree, LendingTree again, LendingTree again, LendingTree again, H&R Block, you really want me to do tax work, TurboTax, LendingTree, it keeps going on. Kind of, what, what's the focus on customer experience? Because obviously Facebook's coming on next, like, I assume that's not the customer experience you actually want. Nope. So like, what, what's causing that? Why are you doing that? It seems sort of obvious that you know, a consumer wouldn't like this. Yeah, I mean, I'm surprised because that's actually not been my experience. But um, I'd love to. I'd love. To, I'm going to come up to you after, and you're going to show me. Um, but I think, I think the reality is that we have not invested enough in making sure that our customer experience is the best one that it could possibly be, um, and we need to fix that. So I'm glad that you raised it, and I think that advertising needs to be smart in order to actually get through to people and clobbering it over the head like that probably not the best way to do it could you just maybe take one second and just define or a couple of seconds maybe just define what you mean by advertising needs to be smart oh um i mean i think it it can't be repeating the same ad over and over again it can't be um in, in the way of you getting the thing that you were actually uh looking for um it should be informative it should be relevant um and i think there are a variety of ways do you have Facebook any apparently voice in that conversation or they just say look you make the content we're going to subsidize it and be happy yeah no i do um but you know we got a lot of different things going on at the same time so um so it's um you know there's a there's there's definitely a balance and and, the, and there's also i think a lot of questions about how all of our different systems again we've just gone through a merger are going to work together right you've got one ad server um that powered yahoo another that powered um aol those things are coming together the audience networks are coming together and so i think in the middle of all of that we found ourselves with experiences like this one which are absolutely not ideal so do your taxes right? do your taxes yeah do rich. your taxes it's a you know we're trying to help you here i said it was service we'll journalism more? yeah real quick yeah. but speaking of of advertising in, in publications does anybody in your experience do it in any way that is even halfway acceptable to the user i mean it feels to me that whether it's the folks here who are organizing this conference or virtually anybody else when you when you think about free free content for the consumer, which is something you, you really embrace and makes a ton of sense to me, it appears that there's very little questioning in the media industry of any business model beyond either advertising or subscription. Um, and when the newspapers that all of us grew up with, they were making a lot of money from classifieds, which are gone and will never come back. Mm -hmm. And so this- Although those are advertisements. They're absolutely advertisements, but they were advertisements in their own sections, which have been taken over by the monsters and whoever else. So the, the question for you is, is there any conversation within the Oath family, um, or for you guys within the Vox family, about business models that are anything but advertising and subscription, given the fact that everybody hates ads? There's, there's no exception to that, even if they're elegantly done. I mean, I read the Wired article on Facebook today, and it was so hard to read because the ads were covering up half the text. Right. Uh, personally, I don't hate ads. We like you them. hate ads? No, we I love hate them. them. I've just been in a war with the New York Times over their gay shirt ad that comes to me. They have a gay shirt? Yes. Oh. I get it. Just me, I guess. I don't like the Zappos ad that tells me to buy the shoe that I just That you bought. already bought. Yeah. yeah. I don't get that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, There's look. There's very little creativity. I think that, I think that um, you know, as far as I know, there, there are basically two and a half ways to make money in media, right? You can adver sell advertising against um, the audience that you're getting. You can sell a subscription. Usually those two go together, right? It's not like if you subscribe to the New York Times, you don't see any ads, you'll see lots of ads. 
Um, and then finally, there's, there's bundling, right? And that also includes ads, right? So if you get CNN as part of your cable bundle, your cable provider, there's money changing hands somewhere that's a sliver of what you're paying is going to them. But then you're also going to see ads in addition to that. Um, so it, they're really, it, they're, every funding model out there includes some form of advertising. And it's really all about diversity of revenue right now. Um, right. Everybody's looking for ways to, um, supplement advertising, not get rid of it. Um, yeah. Peter so, and I are starting a new nightclub called Grumpy's. It's going to be great. Right. <laughs> yeah. We think about it all the time. Good, good. It's going to be great. You guys will talk about it. There's, okay. There will be a subscription model for that. Okay. All right. Lydia, I think great. I would pay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thanks, Kara. Yeah.